good morning, Riverside. How are we doing today? It's good to see all of you. Man, it's so great to be here and to, to worship with you this morning. Uh, we're going to be concluding our Kingdom Come series, which has been a study in the book of, of Matthew. And uh, so you can turn to Matthew chapter 28 uh, in your Bibles as, as you study along this morning. And uh, really, we're going to be looking at this, uh, this kind of question of, okay, now what? Right? We're coming out of Easter Sunday. It's the Sunday after Easter Sunday. And I know my kids woke up this morning and they're kind of like, what is the, the meaning of my existence? There's no basket full of candy. There's no toys. There's no, uh, there's no risen Savior. I mean, there is a risen Savior, you know, but that's, uh, that's a bit beyond their understanding, right? So, um, but in all seriousness, um, man, in any great story, you reach that point, you reach that moment where uh, you, you come to the great battle or the great conflict or the, the great moment of decision, um, and, and the story never ends there because if it ended there, um, it, it would feel artificial, right? And so there's, there's, there's the, the final chapter, right, that, that says, okay, now what does life look like now that that happened? If you're a big Lord of the Rings fan, right? Like they, 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 uh, they have this epic battle. They throw the ring in the fire. Spoiler alert, right? Like, um, um, and then they have to go back to the Shire. And there's, there's some cleaning up that they have to do, right? There, there, there's this kind of this, uh, 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 there's things that need to be, what does life look like now that this happened? Um, <clears throat> and uh, and it, so now Jesus is risen from the grave. He's resurrected. He's alive. And now the disciples are like, okay, so, so now what? What does that mean? And, and it's the same thing really for a lot of us. And, um, and, and sometimes if we don't answer that question in a satisfactory way, it leads to just a very bland, purposeless, disappointing kind of existence. Even as a follower of Jesus, even as a Christian, we can come to a place where we, we don't feel excited to get up in the morning. We don't feel passion. We don't feel, we don't feel uh, God driving us forward. And so it's a really crucial and critical question to answer. And so we're going to look at the answers to that uh, in Matthew 28. And just to prep you for that, I would, I, would, I would ask you this morning, hey, if somebody came up to you and said, hey, what's your purpose? Like, why do you, why, why do you exist? <laughs> What are you here on this planet for? Uh, do, you, do you have an answer to that question? You know, how, how would you answer that if somebody looked at you and said, hey, why, why are you here? Like, what, what's, the, what's the meaning? What's the point of all this? Why, why do we exist? What, what, what is this even all about? What are, you, what are you here to do? What are you trying to accomplish? Because so much of our life is just geared towards like, hey, I'm just trying to get through today. <laughs> I'm just trying to get up. I'm trying to get... Kids fed, trying to get out the door, trying to get in, you know, get dinner, go to bed, repeat, 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 right? But, um, but that's, um, that's not the life of purpose that Jesus wants us to have. And so what we're going to look at is, is a powerful call to missional purpose uh, that we're going to see in this passage today. So let's do this. I'm going to read the passage. Uh, uh, we're going to pray for God to, to speak to our hearts, and then we'll begin to dive in and, and uh, pull it apart. So uh, Matthew chapter 28, we're going to begin in verse 16. It says, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's take a moment and pray. God, Father God, we come before you in humility. We've sung these powerful and wonderful truths about you this morning. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to orient our hearts to remember the things that you're teaching us about who you are and about who we are. And, and I just pray as we look at this, this great commission, this calling, this purpose uh, that you've called us into, God, I just pray that you would ignite something in our heart uh, this morning. Uh, that we would be excited about the things that you're excited about, uh, that we would feel driven to do them, that we would feel empowered, and that we would feel the comfort of your presence as we do it. Um, help us to just get closer to you uh, in a meaningful way today uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so, um, so 
a couple of observations right off the beginning. Ultimately, we're going to get to three points that start with the letter P. So I know you guys are going to love that, right? It's very, uh, it's, it's just classic uh, sermon pattern, right? We're going to talk about the power of Jesus. We're going to talk about the purpose and plan of Jesus. And then we're going to talk about the promised presence of Jesus, right? So, so that's what we get out of this passage. But, but as a little bit of context, this is obviously happening after Jesus has risen from the grave. He appeared to the two Marys. He told them, hey, send the disciples ahead to Galilee. I'm going to go meet you there. And, and what we see here in the passage is that, that they're, they're doing this. And so it says the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Now, um, obviously we know there were 12 disciples, but Judas had betrayed Jesus. And after betraying him, he felt such guilt uh, and, and remorse uh, that he went and he, and he hanged himself. And so, uh, so now there's only 11. And even in this, there's, there's a helpful piece that we see because they're, they're broken, right? The fellowship has been broken. They're kind of limping forward. They don't have their full strength. They're in a position of dependence. Uh, they're in a position of weakness. And Jesus says, that's exactly where you need to be so that I can, I can give you what you need to go forward. It doesn't say that they united the 12 and rode victoriously to, right? They, they're kind of, they're straggling to the mountain because they've been beaten down. They've been, uh, they, they've been knocked back. They've been stripped down to the bare essentials. And Jesus says, now I'm going to refill you with my mission and my plan and my purpose. Um, and sometimes we try and approach God in strength. And what we really need to do is acknowledge our weakness and approach him in our weakness. He already knows we're weak, right? <laughs> we're, not, we're not fooling him when we come and, and, and pretend like we've got it all together. It's much better to go and be honest with God and say, God, man, I need a lot of help. Man, he loves it when we do that. So they're coming. Uh, they're going. And, and, and an echo of what we saw last week with, with the two Marys, uh, the 11 disciples come and they meet Jesus on the path of obedience, we're told that he told them to go to Galilee to a certain mountain and they went there obediently and that's where they had this incredible encounter with him. And, and I think there's something to grab a hold of there because there's so many times that we will begin down a path of disobedience, right? Well, we're on the path of obedience. It's kind of like the Pilgrim's Progress, right? Like we're on their way to the, the celestial city. We're going the right direction, but all of a sudden something shiny is off over here, right? Or, or something pulls us over in this direction and we start going down a path of disobedience and then all of a sudden we're like, man, when I'm praying, I just feel like, I feel like it's just kind of going up into emptiness. And when I read the Bible, it's not really clicking and connecting with me. And, and when I go to church, the sermon, it just, you know, it just kind of goes over my head. And, and we're like, God, where are you? I thought you were going to be near to me. I thought you were going to be with me to the end of the age. And, and a lot of the problems is not the, the problem that God moved. The problem is that we moved off the path of obedience. We put ourselves in, in a path of distraction where we, where we go after something and, uh, and, and it takes us away from the place where we can really hear from God and see him clearly. And, and this is not sort of this philosophical thing. I, I'd be willing to guess that probably about 80% of us in the room are not trying to think like, oh, wow, am I, am I in some way sinning that I'm not aware of? Is there, is there something I did with the right intention, but, but somehow maybe, God, show me. if I, No, most of us are like, man, I know exactly what my struggle is. I know exactly what it is that's, that I know I've got to do, but I haven't had the willpower or the courage or the strength to do. And a lot of times the problem is that we are trying to do it out of our own willpower, our own strength, our own ability. God, I know, I know you're mad at me. I know you're disappointed in me. I'm going to will up the strength to get back over to get close to you. And that's not what he wants. He wants us to admit in the bottom of the pigsty, I, I can't do it. I don't have the strength. I can't come back to you. I can't be worthy of you. I need you to do what I can't do in myself. And when we say that, when we reach that point, that's when he draws us back in. One of the things that I want to do this morning is I want to give you guys a couple tools just to help you kind of think and process because the, the commands of Jesus are really clear here, right? He says, go into all nations, make disciples, teach them to, to observe all that I've commanded you and baptize them. Uh, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but the problem is that, that we all wrestle with that a little bit, right? When, when you were thinking about your purpose, how many of you said, my purpose is to make disciples? That's what Jesus said. That's what I'm doing, right? Like, I know that I'm on this earth for one purpose, and it's to make disciples. The reality is, is in, a, in, a, in a church full of people who love Jesus, that's just not our driving instinct and thought most of the time. 
And so, so we can look at this and be like, man, you know, Jesus. Uh, so, so I want to give you a couple tools today to figure out what this looks like in your own life. And one of them is this. I went to a conference a couple weeks ago, and, and uh, they were pointing out that a lot of times when we sin, it's in one of three areas. And it's the same areas where Satan tempted Jesus when he went into the wilderness. Uh, the first one is appetite. Uh, he said, hey, turn this rock into bread. I know you're hungry. You've been fasting for 40 days. I know, you're, I, I know you want something. Your stomach's good. Just, just turn this to bread and eat it. And Jesus said, hey, man will not live on bread alone, but by, by the word of God, right? Um, some of us are, we're, are most prone to sin in areas of appetite. We just want more. We want more, whatever it is, whether it's food, whether it's lust, whether it's consumerism, whether it's materialism, whether, whatever it is, we just, that, we have a hole in us and we think that if we buy one more thing <laughs> or, or, or eat one more thing or, or develop one more relationship, that somehow that's going to fulfill what, what only God can fulfill. So the first one's appetite. The second one is ambition. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you just bow before me, the devil said. Some of us get tempted by ambition. We want to succeed. And so we'll, we'll sell people out and we'll take shortcuts and, and we'll do what we know God doesn't want us to do because it will mean that we're a success. It will mean that we made it. It will mean that we've achieved something. And, and some of that's driven by our past, right? Maybe you have a history where people told you you were a loser or you were no good or you would never amount to anything or you weren't smart or you weren't capable. And so because of that, you have this drive to prove them wrong and you're just ambitious and you just want to succeed. Um, we used to watch the I Am Second videos. I don't, I don't know if you guys, we did a whole series on those years and years ago. And the one guy that was on there, uh, they said, hey, when they, they asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be the best. And they're like, at what? And he's like, I don't care. <laughs> I just want to be the best at anything, right? It's, it's this drive for, it's, it's ambition. It's just, I just want to succeed. I want to know that I'm good in my own strength, in my own power, in my own ability, rather than resting in the success of Jesus. Paul says, I won't boast in anything except the cross of Jesus. His success over death and the grave, that's what I'm excited about. My own successes can come and go. I saw yesterday, yesterday they had uh, the NFL draft. They have um, the, uh, the final draft pick of the entire draft. It's like, uh, what is it, number 200 and something, right? Is Mr. Irrelevant is the title they give to him, right? And I was thinking about this, and I was like, I mean, yes, in, in the context of the draft, way down the pecking order, compared to everybody in this room, incredibly successful, right? <laughs> Drafted by an NFL team. Like, none of us is going to experience what, that, what that's like. But we let the world put labels of success and failure, and they're so fleeting, and they, and they kind of come and go, right? So, so appetite, ambition. The third one is approval. I just want somebody to say they love me. I just want somebody to, 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 to tell me that I'm good, and I will do whatever to get them to do that. And this is what leads us to, uh, to, uh, to get into relationships physically that we shouldn't get into because we're seeking that approval that ultimately we should only get from God. If he's approved us, who, who else's approval do we need, right? <laughs> once, once, and he has, right? If we put our faith in it, he says, I love you. You're my child. You're forgiven. You're, I've adopted you as a son or daughter. I'm giving you all these precious and great gifts. It, that's the approval that, that, that should resonate in our life. But, but here's the reality, and I'm not speaking this from my, my house, right? We all struggle in all those areas, but for most of us, there's, there's one that's a little bit stronger pull than the other. And, and part of it is identifying in yourself, like, hey, where, where am I tempted to sin? And, and how can I really push into the gospel? How can I look into scripture and say, what, what are the scripture passages that I need to memorize so that when I'm trying to get approval from somebody else, I can go over and say, no, God told me that I'm approved because I know what it says in scripture. When I'm trying to fill my appetites, my fleshly appetites with, with all kinds of things, where can I go to, to remind myself uh, what God has said and how God fulfills those things, right? So, so that's one tool to think about as, as you're thinking about how do, I, how do I learn how to observe all that God has commanded? Part of it is knowing where you're tempted not to believe the things that God has told you so that you can flip it around. And that way we don't go down that path of disobedience and we stay on the path of obedience where we get a chance to meet Jesus. So let's come to these, 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 uh, the, the power P's, right? Uh, we've got the power of Jesus. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. 
And, um, and it's this reference. Uh, Jesus often liked to refer to himself as, as the Son of Man. It was one of his favorite titles for himself. And it's a reference to the Messiah that was prophesied in the book of Daniel. Daniel was an, an ancient prophet. You remember Daniel in the lion's den. And that's kind of his most famous work. That was his, uh, but he wasn't a one-hit wonder, right? He had all these, uh, he has a full book of, of just prophesying and speaking truth. And so here's what he says in Daniel 7.13. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And so hundreds and hundreds of years before, Daniel said, hey, the, the king is coming whose kingdom will never end. And Jesus is saying, that's me. All authority, heaven and earth, has been given to me. I rule and reign over everything. He's invited them to this, this mountain in Galilee, which is where he started his ministry. And sometimes it's referred to as Galilee of the, of the Gentiles in Scripture. And so he's standing up on this mountain, and you imagine them just looking over this vista, and they can see, they can see Jewish lands, and they can see Gentile lands. And Jesus says, all of this is under my authority. And because of that, I'm sending you out to take the good news everywhere. During his earthly ministry, often Jesus would say, hey, I, I came to bring the word first to the people of Israel. In his earthly ministry, he came to bring the news of the Messiah and the good news of the kingdom to the nation of Israel first so that the nations could be blessed through them. But now he's saying, hey, all bets are off. If you see it, it's mine. Go tell the people that the king has come to all the nations. And so, man, I imagine those guys were excited. <laughs> imagine they were also a little bit terrified, right? How, Jesus, how, how, how could we ever do that? And so what difference does it make for you the fact that Jesus has all authority over everything in heaven and earth? Well, here's, here's where it makes real practical difference for us, is, is, is that every day we walk into places that we walk in with the assumption that Jesus is not there, right? You walk into your school, you're like, man, phew, Jesus is not here. You walk into your workplace, you're like, oh man, <laughs> right? You watch the news, you watch our political system, you look at the world, uh, man, it, you just look around and you're like, man. And, and so when you don't see Jesus there and you say, hey, this is, man, Jesus is not here, it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Where you're not looking at him. But, but, it, but, but if you change your perspective and you say, Jesus has all authority over everything here. When I walk into my, my work, Every person there is under the authority of the king. Now, they might be living in open rebellion. They might not even know the truth. But the reality is, is that God loves them, and he desires a relationship with them. And they're seeking to fulfill that relationship through appetite and ambition uh, and approval. But what they really need is Jesus. And when you start to think about it in that way, then you can begin to see how, how the gospel flows into those situations. Jesus is authoritative whether we recognize him or not. He has authority. And so when you walk in knowing that, it changes the way. Instead of walking in in a hopeless situation, you walk into a hopeful situation. Hey, I believe God's going to change something here. This isn't how he wants it to be yet. But he can do everything because he has all power and all authority. And there's all these rich scripture passages that talk about the, the, the authority and the power of Jesus, right? The second thing it talks about is the, the purpose of Jesus. I come back to that, that purpose. Uh, you know, what would you say your purpose is? And here's the reality. Um, here, here's how the sentence should go in your life. And this is, this is another tool you can think about. You know, I exist to know and glorify God and make disciples by dot, dot, dot. Because we're told in Ephesians that we're, we're his workmanship, that we were created to do good works by him. That each one of you sitting in this room has unique relationships and you have unique uh, talents and skills and spiritual giftings and, uh, and, and family history. You have all these things that you are in a unique position that nobody else in the world is in. And, and whatever he calls you to do, it's going to be for the purpose, ultimately, if it's going to last, of glorifying him and making disciples. But the way that we each do it is going to look a little bit different. If there was a one-size-fits-all uh, model, I would just give you guys the, the, I would say DVD, but nobody watches DVDs anymore, do they? <laughs> 
I would, uh, I would text you the link, and you would, uh, you would go on, and you'd be like, oh, okay, that's how I do it. That's what, right? But he gives us some, some context here about what it is, and, and they're all action verbs. Notice how much action verbs are packed into this sentence, right? He says, go. He says, make disciples. He says, baptize. He says, teach. And we're teaching what? We're teaching them to observe. So there's these five action verbs that show us that what God's purpose for us is to go forward, to take action. Now, for, for many years, the emphasis was really on saying, hey, go means go to the nations. And so if you read this passage and you take it seriously, you better be booking your, your ticket for uh, Zimbabwe or Namibia or Brazil, or which some of those sound pretty good, uh, right? But, but it was about this, taking the word to the nations. And certainly that is part of the call to, to every tribe and tongue and nation that we need to take the gospel. Uh, but there's another element in the, in the Greek that uh, could be read as kind of as you are going. And I don't think it's either or. I think it's both and, right? If God calls you to go, then go. But as you're going through this life, each one of you in here, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a missionary to your community. You're a missionary to your home where you live. You're a missionary to the street that you live on. You're a missionary to the, the community that you, that you live in. Like, that's what your calling is. And at some point, God may say, hey, I, I don't want you to be a missionary here. Now I want you to be a missionary over here. But the, 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 the identity remains the same. And once again, it, so much of this is a changing of the mind. When you think about it that way, it changes the way you think about your interaction with your neighbor, right? That neighbor that keeps letting their dog come over and, like, do stuff on your yard, right? And uh, in your flesh, you want to tell them <laughs> what's going to happen to their dog. But, but as a missionary, you're like, wow, this is creating an opportunity for interaction. What am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with this, right? I'm getting a little too personal there. That's, that's something I'm dealing with. <laughs> a lot of dead grass right in front of our door, you know. Um, but it's an opportunity that we have, right? He says, make disciples. Now, I hope you realize none of us can, can truly make disciples, right? We don't have that capacity. The Holy Spirit calls, forms, makes disciples, but we are tools. And this is the amazing, incredible thing of Scripture that, that after Jesus raises from, rises from the dead and, he, and the tomb is empty, he doesn't say, hey, guys, I got it covered. Kick back for a little while. <laughs> the bus will be coming in a little bit to pick you up. We'll take you to heaven. You don't have to do a thing. You don't have to lift a finger. And that's where sometimes our good theology kind of messes us up, right? Because the theology of salvation truly says we cannot earn our salvation. We cannot contribute to our salvation. We don't earn God's love, his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace. He gives it to us unmerited. But once we've received it, the natural result of receiving just that love and grace and forgiveness and mercy poured into you is that it has to overflow. And, and so, so there's this, this call that the, the, the life of a disciple is active. Uh, we're going, we're, we're, we're pursuing the purposes of God, and that's a good reason to get out of bed in the morning. Right? That you've been invited into the king's business. He sent you as an emissary with an important message for people that need to hear it. We're not called to make converts. We're not called to make enemies. We're not called to make uh, fans or friends. We're not called to have people just fill out this card. Right? We're called to make disciples. That are, that's people that are going through this messy process of learning how to observe all that Jesus has commanded. And so one step, one, one thing, and this is not linear, right? It's not like make disciples. How do you make disciples? You baptize them, you teach them, right? Like baptizing and teaching, that's, that's an inherent part of, of making disciples, but it's not a formula. He's pointing to the indicators. And, and so baptism is, is a significant one. And, and let me kind of tie a couple things together here, right? He talks about observing all that I have commanded. Well, how do we do that? How do we observe all that Jesus has commanded? Well, there's a, there's a regular pattern that I see when it's done well and when it's done in a lasting way, and it's this. It's, uh, there's different words for it. Vision, passion, action is one way to look at it. You could talk about it. Head, heart, hands. But the way when it really gets into you is this. First you see it, and then you desire it, and then you do it. And so, uh, so one, one way is sometimes we get confused 
Um, you know, we have this discussion every time we do a, a vision and values class about baptism because there's, there's infant baptism, there's believer's baptism, people get confused. Hey, maybe I was baptized as an infant, maybe I was never baptized, I put my faith in Jesus, um, do I have to get baptized, do I still need to do that, what's, what's And so the thing that we do is we take you to scripture and say, hey, look at scripture, look at all these accounts of baptism in the book of Acts. What do they look like? What's happening? We're seeing the gospel proclaimed. We're seeing people say, I believe that. I believe that's true. And then they're taken and they're baptized as a symbol of that, right? And so the first thing is to look and see, okay, yeah, that's scriptural. Baptism is something. And some of you guys, uh, right, like when, when Keith made that announcement and said, hey, we're doing a worship night. And we're going to do some baptisms. If you're ready to get baptized. And some of you felt that twinge in your heart of like, oh, man, there it goes again. He's talking about baptism. I need to do that. But I'm kind of scared to do that. <laughs> So step one, is it biblical? Yes, it's biblical. It's in there. You can go. You can read about it. You can read right here. Jesus says, go and, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? So, so this, this, it's, it's obedience to a command of Jesus to be baptized. Number two, does it work its way into your heart? Do you want to be baptized? Do you get to the place where you're like, man, not only is, do I know Jesus is telling me I should do that, but I want to do that. I, I'm actually excited about doing that. I, 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 I'm ready to take that step. And then you do it. When you do it that way, that's how life transformation takes place. You see it, you apply it, you do it. You desire it. One of the ways that it gets broken is if you cut the heart out, right? Uh, I see it. God says I'm supposed to give uh, an offering, a tithe to the church. I don't want to do it. <laughs> but I do it anyways. That's not lasting. That's not transformative. It's not actually valuable for you. Now, yes, you're being obedient, but Jesus is more about this. He's more worried about the state of your heart than he is about, about the money that you give. Um, so that's one of the ways that we observe and learn, right? And so baptism is a significant part of that. And, and I just want to mention this. It talks about baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say the names, it says the name. It's a, uh, the, the verb tense is, is singular. And so the, the name of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the book of Acts, uh, sometimes they'll say they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And, and it's not really a problem, right? Um, and so I don't think that he puts this in here as like, and I know we do it, and it's, there's nothing wrong with doing it, saying, hey, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it's not like these are magic incantations that somehow confer baptism, right? We're, we're speaking a truth that we're being baptized in the Trinity. If somebody believes in the Trinity, but says, hey, in the New Testament, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, you know, can I be baptized in the name of Jesus? It's, it's more about, what do you, do you believe in God the Father who sent uh, God the Son, and, and, and he sent God the Holy Spirit, and, and do you have a Trinitarian understanding of, of what the Bible shows? If that's it, I'm not so worried about the words, the semantics. I'm more worried about the state of your heart, right? But sometimes we, we get down to, we want it to be formulaic. So we're baptizing, we're teaching. And so the question is, how are we doing with this? <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to shout it out. You don't have to say it. But man, if, you, if there's a scale of one to ten, and this is Jesus' final command to us on the earth, how do you feel like you're doing? It's a fair question to ask. Because I love you. <laughs> it's a fair question to ask of myself. I ask this question all the time. And we wrestle with it. And let, let me tell you that the church in America is not really generally doing a great job with this. The big purpose that Jesus gave to us is not overall happening really well. And so here at Riverside, we're, we're constantly driving into, hey, what is this supposed to look like? How can we do it better? How can we make sure that we're being obedient to this, this mission, this, this, this command that Jesus gave us? And, and as I already hinted at, the thing that we keep coming back to is, man, we want to see transformed lives. If we see people's lives being transformed by the gospel, that's how we know that the Holy Spirit is making disciples in our church. Now, there's a couple things we can do to set the table. We can take people to God's word, right? So that's one of our core values. Whether you're here on Sunday morning, it's, it's ex exposition of the scripture. We want to get into the Bible. The point of the passage is the point of the sermon. We want you to interact with God's word so you can be transformed by it. Whether it's a Bible study, whether it's a discipleship group, whatever we're doing, the Bible is, 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 has got to be open. We've got to get into it, right? We've got to know what it says. How can you obey something that you haven't seen? And so we know that that's setting the table um, and then really pushing people to, to, to say why. And that's why, so we do it on Sunday morning in sermons. 
We do it through worship. Even the announcements is, is a form of discipleship because we're saying, hey, here's, here's ways that you can get closer to Jesus. It happens in small groups. And honestly, the best ways that it happens is small two, three, four person groups where you can get really real with each other. And you can say, hey, it says here that I'm forgiven. What does that mean to you? What does forgiveness look like in your life? Because that's where we're pushing it from the head down into the heart. And then we get back together in a week or two and we say, hey, how'd you do with that? You mentioned you're struggling with forgiveness with that person. Did God help you with that? It, it, it's not clean, it's not simple, but it's beautiful. And there's no better feeling than when God uses you as a tool in his hands to speak a transformative truth into somebody's life and you see that light bulb come on and you see them get it. Man, that's, that's what life is about. That's, that, that's when you're connected into the king's mission for his kingdom. Let me just say this in closing, and I'll invite the band to come up here. Um, the, the purpose is sandwiched between God's power and the promise of God's presence. That Jesus is going to give us the power to do what he's called us to do, and he's going to be with us in it. We saw in, in Matthew throughout Emmanuel, in Matthew that we see Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. And at the very end of the book, he says, I am God with us. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. You don't have to do this on, the own, and on your own. Band, you can come on up. Um, you, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to try and figure out how to do it. You don't come, have to come up with schemes and plans. You just have to, to get into my presence. You just have to lean into my power. You have to commit to my purpose. And if you do that, I'll be with you.